live episode. It's been a while since I've done a live chat and I just thought I want to talk to you all. I want the interaction. Uh, I hope you've all been enjoying my Royal Musings video where I go out in the garden most mornings and just sort of muse about what's going on with the latest Royal Family news. So the live chats are a little bit different. If you haven't been to one of my live chats before, please get involved. Please ask a question in the live stream. And of course, if you do have any other questions or any topics after the event, if you're watching back on catch up or, or playback um, after the live chat is finished, please put them in the comment section and I may drop them down on my notes to talk about in an upcoming video. So welcome to the video. We are the 26th of February, 2023. Can you believe it? We are almost in March. And as I expected, sort of coronation details were a little bit thin on the ground up until sort of this point. So the March now, coming up to March, all the way through until the coronation, we are going to be having lots of, I think, drip feed information <laughs> released about the coronation. I don't think we're going to have one big massive sort of information drop. We might do a little bit more closer to the time, but up from now, probably pretty much up until we get to the coronation, I think that we're going to be drip fed information. And we do have a few details to talk about uh, today. So um, hello and welcome to everybody. Uh, I can see people in the chat already, so I'll just give you all a little bit of a wave. Okay, so I'm hoping you can all hear me. I do have the microphone on and I hope it's working. Okay, so the first thing, um, the first hint of Camilla finally, officially from Buckingham Palace, I've been pleading so much to drop the consort title from her official title. So as we know, any wife or spouse of a reigning male monarch is technically a consort, uh, a queen consort. So not a reigning monarch in their own right. Camilla is not Her Majesty, you know, the sovereign. She's, she's not the queen, uh, but she will be a queen. She will, she's Charles's consort queen. In a kind of a way, Prince Philip was uh, the late queen's prince consort, but he didn't have the prince consort as an official title. He was her consort, but he was never really referred to officially as such. He was always known by his title, which of course was His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, and he was a prince of the United Kingdom in his own right. But he was never officially the prince consort, as, for example, Queen Victoria's husband, Albert, was known as the prince consort. So let's forget about the men for a moment because it is a little bit different. What we do um, have a history of, a lot more history and a lot more precedence is of queen consorts. So for example, Queen Elizabeth, the queen mother, our late queen's mother, um, was a queen consort. The queen's grandmother, Queen Mary, was a queen consort. Queen Alexandra was a queen consort. Queen Charlotte was a queen consort. But they officially were not addressed as the queen consort. Um, they were known as Queen Alexandra, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth. Um, so it was a little bit odd uh, that they went down the route of Camilla being known as the Queen Consort. Now, we know when Queen Elizabeth, the, the late Queen Elizabeth, made the decision that it was her wish that Camilla should be queen, um, it was noted there that it was, it, it was Queen Consort. And I think that's where this has come from. And I always thought that there was going to be a bit of a transition period in between when the late Queen Elizabeth passed away and the coronation. So that's what has actually happened. That's what's transpired. I did say that, that that's what I thought one of the options could be, um, was that she would be known as the Queen Consort, officially addressed as the Queen Consort, up until the coronation. Post-coronation, she would be simply referred to as Her Majesty the Queen or Queen Camilla. Um, so that's what's happened. Buckingham Palace has indicated that post-coronation, consort will be dropped from the official, um, what they officially address her as, even though she will still be a consort queen, um, but she will, you can simply call her Her Majesty the Queen or um, Queen Camilla, Her Majesty Queen Camilla. Any one of those is fine. Or if you were to meet Camilla in person, you might want to do a curtsy or a bow. Um, you don't have to, by the way, uh, but it is, you know, it is, 
probably manners. Most people would probably choose to do a bit of a bow or a curtsy. Let me know in the comments, if you met <laughs> Charles or Camilla or any other royal, would you curtsy or bow? Let me know. I think I would. I think if I met them, I think it'd be very, very hard not to just naturally just do, I wouldn't do like a full, I mean, I wouldn't do a Meghan Markle curtsy. You know, I wouldn't do the whole, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Absolutely not. No, I would just do like a little, little head bow, I think, uh, would be appropriate. Um, so I think I would. Uh, so simply, if you were to meet Camilla, just address her as your majesty to begin with. And then if you're lucky enough to speak to her again in the day, you can just call her mom. Mom or ma'am, ma'am if you like, ma'am as in jam. <laughs> so, so there you go. That's how you would um, talk to Queen Camilla if you met her. But I'm really, really glad that they are finally dropping this whole consort nonsense. And, you know, she will be known as Queen Camilla, which I think is really, really good. Um, let's just see what people are saying. Everyone's saying hello. Oh, Miami, Sterling's from Miami. Well, I, I went to Miami last year and it was really, really gorgeous. Uh, surprise it's June said you were right about when the consort will be dropped for Queen Camilla I was well actually what what I did what I normally do on this channel is when we don't know something I go through a range of options of what I think the outcome could be one of those options that I discussed was that post coronation uh, consort would be dropped and that's what I suggested would be was the strongest option um, you know, a lot of people sort of claim that they know exactly what's going to happen. And, you know, the truth is no one actually knows what's going to happen until it actually happens. So that was something that I speculated was most likely to happen based upon, you know, a history of knowledge that I have built up. And there you go. It, it was proved correct. Um, let's have a look. Hello to Pat. Oh, Ishtak says, hell will freeze over before I call her my queen. Well, <laughs> let's put it this way. Throughout history, monarchs um, and their consorts have either been liked or disliked, or they have been figures such as what we would call a Marmite figure, where you either love them or you hate them. Henry VIII, for example, you know, was not universally loved. Um, you know, Protestants and Catholics, they had divided opinion upon him. Um, queen, queen Anne Boleyn uh, was actually not a very popular queen. Um, you know, a lot of people at the time, a lot of the population, although they dare not say it on the pain of death and execution, uh, but a lot of people didn't support the Queen Anne um, because they thought that she had usurped uh, Catherine of Aragon. So what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is it matters not what our own personal opinions, whichever way they might fall, are on the current monarch or the current monarch's consort, it matters not one jot uh, because we have them whether we like them or not. Fortunately, I don't think Camilla is going to send you to the tower, lock you up and chop your head off if, um, if you voice your opinion that you don't like her. I think you're pretty safe. Uh, you're not going to go to the tower. So, so what I'm trying, yeah, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter whether we like them or not, we have them. Uh, so it's like, you better get used to it. Um, but no, you certainly don't have to bow or curtsy to her. Um, so have a look. Uh, Lacey says, I'm okay with the consort drop. I just feel, well, it, it doesn't matter if you weren't okay with it, <laughs> it, it happens. Um, you just feel that Camilla should have a, a demoted title because deplorable behaviour as a mistress. Well, kings, as I've just said with about Henry VIII, kings of the past have had deplorable, uh, deplorable behaviours, um, and yet they still have the highest titles that they have. You know, we are not in Big Brother. It's not Love Island. It's not The Bachelor. You know, we can't vote these people in and out because it's a constitutional monarchy, not a democratic presidency, if you like. Um, so, I mean, there is that debate to have, you know, people, there are some people in the UK that want, you know, a, a, a democratic presidency, if you like, or our version of it, 
Most people don't. I mean, most people, when there's polls, um, the, the support for the monarchy is usually consistently high. And I think we are actually still at, you know, a really good level of support for monarchy right now. Um, Sterling says, I don't know if I like Queen Camilla, but only because I think Camilla isn't a regal sounding name. Well, it will be. I mean, think about it. We've not had a Queen Camilla before. So whenever there is the first of something, it takes a while to sink in. And in years to come, you know, 50 years to come, 100 years to come, people will look back and think that Camilla is a regal sounding name because she was the first to have that name. So it's just, I think, because we're not used to it. Werner says, will you be doing a live broadcast during the coronation? Probably, probably not live because I want to actually watch it. And um, people have, have commented and asked me in real life, actually, will I be going to actually see the coronation and experience it in London? And whilst I think these big set piece royal events are an experience in themselves when you're there, in terms of actually being able to see the whole event as a whole, as it happens, rather than watching on catch up later, um, is that you're pretty much stuck in one, in one spot, really. You know, you have to get there days before, you have to stake out a really good place on the ceremonial route. Sometimes you have to camp out overnight, you have to use the porter toilets. Um, you have to have someone to keep your place in, you know, in the, by the railings. You'll probably only get a really quick glimpse of the carriages going by. Oh, we're going to talk about the carriages in a moment because there's um, a new piece of information about the Gold State carriage. So we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so you might only see that cars whiz by or a carriage whiz by. You're pretty much stationary in one place. If you're positioned on the Mall, which is probably the best place to be, you may then be able to go down the mall and uh, find a good position in front of the Buckingham Palace balcony because it is expected that we will have a balcony appearance with just the key working members of the royal family, potentially even just Charles and Camilla, William and Catherine and the Wales children. I'm still trying to get used to not calling them the Cambridge children, so do forgive me in videos if I refer to them as the Cambridge children. I'm still getting used to the Wales children. So in terms of will I watch it on TV, I think you'll get a much better overall view. You'll get all the really good camera shots. You'll get all the audio. I'm sure there'll be screens put up on the Mall and in some of the Royal Parks. But I actually think you'll get a better view at home in your comfy clothes with snacks and drinks and watching everything on TV, flicking between the different news stations trying to find the best coverage. I think that is the best way, really, of enjoying it. And of course, the coronation celebrations go on over three days. So there's lots to experience. Uh, but I will be doing probably a live stream after the coronation. Um, Heather says, no way would I ever refer or accept her as queen. Again, it matters not, Heather. I'm sorry, but you're... <laughs> It doesn't matter. She she is your queen. Um, Jeff Prov says they called Anne Boleyn the queen too. They did. Uh, and I've just lost your comment. It's got, oh, there we go. Hang on. Where's your comment gone? They called Anne Boleyn the queen too, but she was um, she was the toy uh, toy woman. Well, she she was his mistress for a while because um, Henry VIII kind of fell out of love with well, no. He, I don't think he necessarily completely fell out of love with her, although he did treat her very badly after he married Queen Anne. He sent her to um, basically a very run-down um, castle, and it was very damp, and she basically died of consumption, where she, you know, she wasn't looked after very well. She had a very small allowance. Anyway, um, he did you know, cheat on, on Catherine with Anne, and was his mistress, um, but he fell out of love with Catherine, I mean, it was purely because she failed to produce male heirs. And after many, many pregnancies, um, you know, only one child survived, which went on to be Queen Mary I. And of course, um, Henry wanted a male heir. Times have changed now, you know, it doesn't matter. Since uh, the birth of, of Prince George, 
it doesn't matter whether you have a girl or a boy, um, the girl will not be supplanted in the line of, of succession by, um, by a, a younger brother, a younger male heir. So times have changed, fortunately, since the Tudor times. Um, Lacey says she will just be Camilla to me. She's just like Wallace Simpson. Well, I can think of someone else who is a little bit similar to Wallace Simpson, a bit more than Camilla. At least Camilla's, Camilla's dutiful. Amber Gordon says, uh, that's good, adding the consort is a mouth. Yeah, to be honest, it is a bit of a, a tongue twister to get through. Hilda says, uh, you're from the USA. I would not call her queen. Well, she's not technically your queen, but, you know, you, we, we do address, and even in the UK, if we have visiting foreign dignitaries, uh, we address them by their titles. If we have foreign monarchy, um, coming over, we we call them queen or king, so it doesn't really matter. Um, Julie says, as I like to say, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. Verna says, whilst I love Diana and I did resent Camilla as the mistress who won, uh, well, I don't ever think Camilla really wanted to be queen, to be quite honest. I think she would have been actually quite happy um, being a mistress, a long-term mistress. I think Camilla was quite happy with her country house, her horses, a quiet life. I don't think she's ever really coveted um, being queen. I think she'd have been quite happy with, you know, if Diana could have accepted, you know, Charles having a mistress. I think she would have been quite happy with Diana having the glory, being the queen. Um, you know, I don't actually truthfully really think that Camilla is really wanted it. She's ended up with it um, as a consequence of love. Um, She's ended up in a position where she is today. Sterling says, uh, Camilla might have been the mistress, but she was Charles's love before Diana. It's complicated. I mean, if there was, if Charles had a Facebook status, it would say it's complicated. And as we all know, most of us, I think, are adults who, you know, may have experienced some degree of life and not everybody, you know, not everyone's relationship or marriage lasts you know and that's one thing that we're, I'm going to lead I'm going to segue into is the fact that there are a lot of blended families these days lots of times people enter marriage and for whatever reason it doesn't work um, and they enter second marriages sometimes third marriages there are children from these different relationships and more than not many people have a form of a blended family or a very different family background to what is traditional you know sometimes now we have two moms we have two dads we have all sorts of different families and I think one thing that this coronation is going to reflect is modern times we've already had the length of the service cut back and now the makeup of it the guest list um, the people that are involved in the ceremonial events is very much going to reflect modern times we have seen that Camilla wants her grandchildren. She's got five grandchildren from her first marriage to Tom Parker Bowles. Um, and she wants them to hold the canopy of estate. So the canopy of estate, well, I mean, it normally has, I think, four. I think it's actually four uh, poles. But they're going to have to work in a fifth one somewhere, maybe one at the back. So maybe there'll be uh, two at the front, two at the back. And well, actually, it's three at the back, perhaps that could work. Um, but they are older grandchildren, so they are capable of having a ceremonial role. But normally, this role, uh, by the way, this part of the ceremony is actually one of the most uh, sacred parts of the ceremony. It's when the anointing takes place. So the holy anointing oil is placed on the forehead of the monarch. And this bit is so holy, it's so sacrosanct that it, this bit is not televised. And what they did with the Queen's coronation, the, the late Queen Elizabeth, they had a canopy of a state and it's all kind of closed off so that, so that the cameras and the spectators can't see the anointing of the holy oil. Um, it's when all of the robes and the ceremonial robes are stripped off. And basically, I mean, unless they change what the outfit is, uh, they're normally wearing like some kind of, like white, simple robe, almost a bit like what in the olden days they might wear to bed, <laughs> if you like. So it's everything stripped back. It's all very holy. And 
this most sacred role of holding the canopy is normally performed by duchesses. And it seems that Camilla, for her anointing, wants to do away with the duchess's role and she wants her grandchildren. And I actually, I'm not mad at it. To be perfectly honest, I actually think it's quite nice having family involved in a very poignant moment in your life. So I'm not mad at it. I think it will be quite sweet. Um, I think when we're all watching it, we'll forget that we're not having duchesses, that we don't even, I mean, to be honest, we don't really know Camilla's grandchildren. They have been shielded um, from press attention quite well, actually. Uh, they don't really covet any limelight. They're not doing any crazy things. They're not selling stories. They're not writing books. They're not going on Oprah. They're not doing any sort of kiss and tell. So, you know, they've actually been really dutiful to the crown. And I think to have this um, ceremonial role in their grandmother, the, the Queen's um, own anointing, is going to be um, just a really nice, enlightening moment and shows where we've come from, uh, where it was just duchesses, and now we're having family involved, blended family. And it goes to show as well that Charles is welcoming Camilla's side of the family in, um, which I think kind of shows the sort of man that he is. You know, he is very welcoming. As we saw, you know, when he offered to walk Meghan, for example, down the aisle, he was very warm, he was very welcoming. And at times like this, he does step up. Okay, let's go down. I'm going to scoot down, down the comments a little. Um, let's have a look. Uh, Queenie says she should not be referred to as Queen because she isn't. Well, there's two types of Queen. There's a Queen Sovereign, a Queen Regnant. Uh, i.e. if you are born to be the sovereign, if you are in the line of succession and the crown for some reason falls to you, then you are a queen, as Queen Elizabeth, the late Queen Elizabeth was. But if you marry someone who becomes king or is king, you become a queen consort. So there are two types of queen. Um, one is technically, I suppose, higher or more important than the other. A queen sovereign, a queen regnant does have the sovereign's power, if you like, or rather soft power these days, as it is in a constitutional monarchy. Um, so she she very much is queen. Sterling says, oh, I thought uh, that a priest uh, anointed the queen. Yes. Yes. No, no. The duchesses don't do the anointing. They hold the poles of the canopy. <laughs> I better make that perfectly clear. The archbishop does the anointing. The duchesses, or now the grandchildren, are going to hold the canopy of a state. The four posts. Now, we don't know exactly who is going to hold the king's poles. Um, you know, his own grandchildren are a little bit young. So there's talk that Prince George potentially could have some kind of significant role. I'm not quite sure what that is. Details have not come through. And we have been told that camera angles and camera shots will focus mainly on the direct heirs. So we'll see Prince William's face quite a lot, and we should see Prince George. Now, this is all dependent upon uh, Prince George being safe. So if at any moment on the run-up to the coronation, William and Catherine and the King and the Queen feel that Prince George is going to be overexposed or put at any kind of risk, then his role could be reduced. Uh, but it's expected that we are going to see Prince George undertaking some kind of role, albeit we don't know entirely what that is at the moment. Um, yes, coronation on the 6th of May. Um, so now I'm going to go, but by the way, if you do have any really burning questions that you'd like to ask me, then please ask away. So we also saw Camilla weighed into a little bit of a topical debate at the moment that's going on in the UK. So I'm sure you've all heard of Roald Dahl, the author. He wrote Matilda, The Twits, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and so many other children's classics uh, that are now modern classics, basically. Um, books that I enjoyed growing up, books that I'm sure your children and grandchildren have enjoyed. So there is a debate. The publisher, I think it might have been Penguin, um, 
had decided to change certain parts of his book um, to make them more inclusive. And by inclusive, there was a few things that I, I just just boggled my mind as to why they would they would even change it. For example, in Fantastic Mr. Fox, uh, Mr. Fox's children are all sons. Um, now they've changed them to daughters, and it's like, why? That, 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 was that really offending anybody? I don't know. Anyway, I have I have really one personal train of thought on this. And I think Camilla has the same because in a speech, she did kind of call out this changing of authors' works of art. So I think that if you are um, a living artist, whether you've written a song or a poem or a book or anything, I think you have the power to change your own work. If you want to reflect and you want to update and you want to change your song or your book, whatever it might be, that is your prerogative and that is perfectly 100% fine. What I draw the line with, and I think Camilla agrees as well, is changing people's art that are no longer here, i.e. they are dead, um, because they don't give their consent to change their original art. Because you think about it, Roald Dahl intended for Mr. Fox to have sons. He intended Augustus Gloop to be called fat. He did, you know, all these very vivid descriptions. That was his art. It was his choice. He's no longer here to change that art. Um, so I don't really think we should be messing around with people's art. Anyway, Camilla, um, she was launching, um, obviously, she's launching her Queen's uh, reading room and that was the first hint that we got of the consort title being dropped because it was referred to as the queen's reading room not the queen's consort uh, reading room so that was the first hint before the official announcement anyway she in a speech kind of mentioned this kind of changing and and she supported authors um you know not not having to sort of compromise and change their artwork and language to fit other people's expectations. I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine going back and really completely rewriting Charles Dickens or Shakespeare? I know we've had modern interpretations of Shakespeare and, uh, and Charles Dickens, but actually to go back and completely change the whole text and add paragraphs and blah, 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 it's, it's tampering with art. It's like going to the Mona Lisa and, you know, changing her smile to make it, you know, more pleasing for, for people today. Or, I don't know, covering up some, some decolletage or, I don't know, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Anyway, Camilla felt the same way. She called it out and then the publisher issued a statement saying that they were also now going to reflect on, on their decision and they were going to publish the revised books but also published the publish the um, traditional copies as well. So a victory for Camilla. And this is how, an example of how very subtly you can make a difference, very subtly you can use your influence and you can use your power. Certain people, certain royals should take note of Camilla because just by using a little bit of soft, you know, persuasion, if you like, or comments, the power of words in a speech, um, Camilla actually pretty much got this reversed. Uh, so well done, Camilla. I think it was bravo, bravo, your majesty. Um, Amber Gordon says, yes, it's just like uh, all the people who take Jane Austen's characters uh, and make their own stories up of established known characters. Well, I mean, I don't mind people, like, I don't mind fan fiction. Fan fiction's fine. Um, but it's, changing the original person's work and then putting it out in their own name when they don't consent to it. That is what I have a problem with. Um, Carmen, hello Carmen, says, I just can't stop being angry, oh dear, <laughs> uh, from seeing Camilla up there becoming queen. I mean, she's responsible for the many problems that's going on between these families. I don't think we can uh, apportion blame um, without really knowing the full facts. I mean, I, by the, the troubles and problems that's going on, I believe that you mean uh, between, of course, the Sussexes and the rest of the royal family. Um, 
it's very hard to say without knowing the full picture and bearing in mind from Harry's point of view, we only have one half of a story. Um, and one half of a story, a full picture, we cannot paint. Let's put it that way. You know, unless the royal family were to do Oprah and to write their own books and blah, 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 which they're not going to do. They aren't going to do that. I think they will maintain a dignified silence, which is probably driving Harry and Meghan loopy. Uh, because Harry and Meghan seem to be digging themselves deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into a hole. The more they say, the more they reveal, the more scrutiny that they receive, the more they open themselves up. I mean, it's massively backfiring, to be quite, to be quite honest. Um, so I think a dignified silence is the way. But no, certainly we don't know the whole picture. And, you know, unless we did know the whole picture, we can't really apportion blame in this case. Well, rather an intelligent person would not apportion blame. Uh, Armel says we can't blame Camilla for everything. Uh, well, no, I mean, one of the things that Camilla most definitely has done right is she's been this stable rock for Charles. Um, I don't think Charles would be the king that he is now. I don't think he would be as stable as self-assured. I don't think he would be as settled or even necessarily as confident as he is now without the love and support of a very strong woman. Camilla is, whatever you think about her, she is a rock. She is strong. She is dependable. Um, she seems very unflappable. Uh, I mean, I'm sure she does have her moments. Everyone has has their moments, but she's very unflappable. She's very calm. Um, and that kind of presence in Charles's life has certainly helped to shape the kind of king he is. And I do think he's a very conscientious king. I think that in years to come, he may even be known as Charles the Conscientious. I'm going to put that out there because he is conscientious of other religions. He's always championed not just the Christian faith of which is head of the church. He's championed Islam. He's, you know, all different sorts of religions he has uh, championed. He's also championed, since the launch of the Prince's Trust, di different um, ethnic groups as well. Uh, disadvantaged people. The Prince's Trust helps young disadvantaged people, many of whom, um, you know, are from different backgrounds. So he's very conscientious of the environment, people around him, um, societies, religions, you know, other countries, things going on. He is very conscientious. And I don't think, you know, I think Diana was a little bit right in the Panorama interview when she said that, you know, she feared for, or rather questioned his ability to cope with being king. And I think at that time, that was probably quite accurate. But sort of being in an open, loving relationship with Camilla getting married to her, I think it's very much stabilised him. And what we're seeing now is a very stable king because of Camilla, very much in the same way that George VI was very much stabilised by the late Queen Mother. You know, she was a rock. And I think, um, you know, George VI and Charles are both very sensitive characters. I definitely think that Charles has inherited from his grandfather a very sensitive side very conscientious but sensitive and both men recognize in themselves that they need a very strong and dependable spouse. Um, George VI found that in the Queen Mother, Charles found that in Camilla. The problem with Charles and Diana was that they both were sensitive, they both had their own needs, they both needed a rock, they both needed each other to be that rock and the problem is when you've got two people that have the same needs they weren't able to do it so they were a mismatch i think initially there could have been some kind of attraction because you recognize in each other that you've got very similar qualities but like i say if neither of you can be that stable rock for each other then the foundation is just going to crumble and that's what we saw fortunately for charles he still had camilla to fall back on. And I think that's what we saw. Um, he needed that rock. He needed that support. He found Camilla. He's ended up being happy. The shame in all of this, of course, is that Diana, Diana's life was tragically cut short. And in doing so, we're in a position where, you know, 
had things been different, she may have gone on to, fa- to find, you know, her own rock, her own happiness. And, you know, in an ideal world, we'd be here today with Diana and Charles, both happy, both happily potentially remarried. Diana could possibly have gone on to have other children. And I don't think anybody would, would have been questioning really anything. But it's the issue that Diana never got to find her peace. She never got to find her own happiness that some people, and I think it's a bit wrong to then question Charles's happiness, just because Diana never got to find hers, which is a shame. Uh, I wish more than anything that Diana would have lived and that she would have gone on to find her own peace and happiness. And then we could have had, you know, we could have had two very, two very successful stories post-divorce. Um, but unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. And I don't think that we should be persecuting Charles and Camilla for, for having their happiness um, just because a tragedy happened where Diana couldn't find hers. Um, and Carmen says, so true about Diana. Thank you. Um, also, I mean, one thing I would like to talk about as well is um, uh, Andrew and Sarah Ferguson. So we know all this stuff that's going on about Royal Lodge. I personally think that they will move house. I'm going to call it, I think they will probably potentially move out towards the end of the year, possibly going into Wood Farm on the Sandringham estate. I think Charles could, could potentially um, lease them that for very, very, very low money. Um, and I can see perhaps, um, you know, them moving perhaps to Wood Farm. But that depends upon how much money Andrew and Sarah actually have because we don't know what the legacy from the Queen was. Uh, we don't know how much money Andrew has from from his mother. But I do only think it is a matter of time before he moves out of Royal Lodge. Um, all sorts says the late Queen mother, who when her husband was alive was known as the Queen, absolutely. And while Camilla will always be, well, no, she won't always be the Queen Consort. They've changed it now. <laughs> uh, she should be referred to as the Queen. Yes, absolutely. All of the uh, Queen Consorts have been known as Queen Alexandra, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Anne, Queen whatever. Uh, Lacey says, uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Thank you. And Kim says, I like Camilla. I'm not without sin, so I try not to judge. Not many people are. And you'll probably find that these people that are screaming that they find Camilla deplorable, they're probably three times divorced. <laughs> you know what I mean? People, you know, hold up a mirror. And they, people need to hold up a mirror to themselves and look at their own lives and ask themselves, have you been perfect? Have you done everything right? I mean, what's, what's Camilla really done? A crime of love, a crime of passion. Um, you know, at least, at least we have an impassioned queen. At least we have a queen that has love in her heart. We don't have someone that's like an empty, an empty, vapid, you know, bag that's, that's just, you know, got no personality. I mean, Camilla is full of personality. Um, you know, she's always laughing. When you see Charles and Camilla together, you can see that they're having a good time. The looks they give each other, the glances, the stifled giggles that they have when they're on engagements together. It all goes to show and support a loving relationship that's very healthy. It's a healthy relationship. And that's what Charles and Diana didn't have. I mean, what would these people rather have? Would they rather have kept Charles and Diana in a very unhealthy, unhappy marriage? Like I say, the only, you know, really bad thing in all of this is that Diana didn't get to find her own happiness. But we should not deny Charles and Camilla theirs. Because that's just not fair. Um, Amel, or Amel, Amel says, Mountbatten should have allowed Charles to marry Camilla in the first place. It would have solved a lot of problems, but if, you, if that would have happened, we wouldn't have, um, you know, the current, you know, monarchy that we do have. And we do have, I think, a very stable succession. I think William and Catherine are going to be a really good king and queen consort. Um, when the time comes, I think they will step up and perform that duty, 
really, really well. Um, again, they work very well as a couple. And, you know, George is very young and, you know, we still have, we still have yet to see uh, a lot of George. He's still very, very young. Um, over the coming years, we will start to begin to see a picture of the sort of character that will go on to become king. But as we know from William and Harry, the characters necessarily that they are when they're young doesn't always feed through into when they are adult. So um, we'll, we'll wait and see. At the moment, all we're seeing is sort of, you know, slight personality traits coming through. Uh, I, I, we get a little bit of a cheeky sense with George. Um, could have inherited that from the Spencer's side. Um, and, but yeah, I do think, I do think George will be a successful king as well, but time will tell. Um, Eileen says, if Camilla survives Charles, what will Camilla be called? She'll be a dowager queen. She will be um, a dowager, dowager queen Camilla. She'll still be her royal highness. Well, no, she'll still be her majesty, rather. Her majesty, um, Majesty the Queen Camilla, a dowager queen, basically. Um, Elizabeth, the queen mother, was also a dowager queen after the death of George VI. However, we didn't call her a dowager queen. Um, she, was, she became known as the queen mother. And that was because she was the mother of, of the sovereign. So, of course, Camilla will not be known as the queen mother because she is not the mother of William. And one thing that I had always mused and thought about was what if Diana would have been alive? What would Diana's title have been when William becomes king? And I often go back to my thoughts about um, a Tudor uh, king. So Henry VII and his mother, Margaret Beaufort, when he became king, he referred to his mother, who, um, who obviously wasn't previously married to a king um, because he, he came to the throne in battle. Um, he referred to his mother as... Um, as um, it was uh, my her royal highness um her royal highness the king's mother that was it i think it was her, her royal highness the king's mother and i think that's quite a nice title and i always thought that uh being a divorced member of the royal family i thought that william could have given diana uh, no it was my lady it was my lady the king's mother i think diana could have been known as my lady the king's mother i think that would have been a really nice touch for Diana's title. Um, Amal says, thank goodness William was born before Harry. Quite. <laughs> Quite. Um, Wicked Felina says, Queen Mother was called that because Queen Mary was still alive. Well, there have all been, I think, other Queen Mothers as well. Uh, but yes, you are technically right. When, um, when after the abdication the, and the death of, obviously, George V and, and the death of George VI, there were three queens. We had Queen Mary for a very short time, um, and we had Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and we had Queen Elizabeth, the new queen. I don't think it was technically because there was three queens. If, for example, our late queen had a different name, like Victoria or something, we would have had Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Victoria uh, all at once. And there would have been no problems deciphering between them. The problem was that we had two Queen Elizabeths. We had Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and we had Queen Elizabeth, the Sovereign Queen. So they wanted some kind of distinction between the two Queen Elizabeths, not Elizabeth and Queen Mary. It wasn't a distinction between the Dowager Queens. It was a distinction between the two Elizabeths. Uh, will Camilla be crowned? Yes, with the consort's crown. And she's actually chosen to use Queen Mary's consort's crown. And the um, Koh i Noor diamond that's very controversial has been removed. It's now being fitted with the Cullinan diamonds. Uh, I think the Cullinan uh, fifth is the, is the big kind of heart-shaped Cullinan diamond. And that will be in the centerpiece. And the other ones, otherwise known as Granny's Chips, Granny's Chips will be 
inserted into Queen Mary's crown and um, I'm sure it will be dazzling and gorgeous as ever. In fact, I actually prefer the Cullinan diamonds to the Koh-i-Noor. I've always thought the Koh-i-Noor diamond is very big, which is why it's so valuable and whatever. But I actually think it makes that crown look like a cyclops. And once you get that image in your head of the Koh-i-Noor right at the front, very round, looking like a big, big old cyclops eye right in the middle of the crown, you cannot get that image out of your head. So I, for one, am actually really happy and pleased that the Koh-i-Noor has gone. I actually really don't like the diamond. I think it's too big uh, to be right in the middle of, of, of a crown. I, it would be better in a scepter or something of that nature. If it could be repurposed into a scepter or something, I'm sure it would look much better. But as a centerpiece, it's too round. It looks like a big old cyclops eye. I don't like it. I never really did like it, to be quite honest. So this more heart-shaped uh, Cullen and the fifth diamond that, that will be in the centre, I think will be a lot more pleasing. And they'll possibly put some other diamonds around and then the other Cullinan pieces will be um, somewhere towards the top. So I am actually really approving of the changes that are being made to the Queen Mary's crown. I think it will be a lot better. Uh, Carmen says you are hilarious. Well, it, it does. It does. Um, it does. It looks like. Bring a picture up of it. I'm not, sorry, I can't put a picture when I'm doing a live chat. I can't put a picture on. But bring up, you know, the. The, the Koh-i-Noor diamond in the crown, although what will probably come up is a picture of Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth's consort crown, uh, the Queen Mother's consort crown, um, because that's the one that it was most recently set in. So but if you look at that, it just looks like a big old cyclops eye. And once you get that image in your head, you cannot unsee it. Um, Kaneta says, yes, so glad Prince William was first born. Has it been confirmed if Harry and Meghan will show? No, we've we've no official... If anyone's out there making videos saying that they know if Harry and William are coming, they don't. There has been no official confirmation, one way or the other, whether or not Harry and Meghan are going to come. All we can do at the moment is speculate on what the options are. The, the first option is that they're not even invited. The second option is they're invited. The third option is they're invited. They both come. They both don't come. They refuse. Harry comes by himself. Um, or they all go over as a family because it's Archie's birthday, but only Harry goes to the actual coronation and Meghan and Archie stay behind at Frogmore Cottage. We don't know. We don't know which one of these is going to be. If they do come, we don't know what level of involvement. Will they be on a front bench? Will they be on a back bench? Will the camera even be on them? Will they be seen walking in any kind of procession? We do know that there probably wouldn't be a role for Harry at the ceremony. Uh, and we do know that the balcony appearance is going to be limited to working royals. Um, so we do know that little bit. But in terms of if Harry wants an apology beforehand, I don't think that's going to happen. I think, I mean, someone commented in one of my previous videos, um, sort of saying that, you know, someone in my position should be perhaps putting out there a way forward for reconciliation and kind of talking about a pathway um, where, where, reconciliation can take place and I thought about it <laughs> and really there's only one clear pathway that I can actually think of I don't think either side are going to give in I don't think either side are going to cave in and ex accept um, liability for how the relationship has kind of soured I don't think we're going to get that both sides think that they are correct and right so my way forward, the only way that I can see forward is the old fashioned way of drawing a line in the sand, agreeing to disagree. And there is nothing wrong with, you know, looking at someone, even family or friends. There's no point in jeopardizing a future relationship on the basis of a past relationship. If you want a relationship with that person, there is nothing wrong with drawing a line in the sand and saying, look, what's happened before 
is the past. We need to agree to disagree. There's nothing wrong with agreeing to disagree. It's a very grown up thing to do. Um, and moving on, concentrating on their relationship now and in the future. That is the only way that I can see forward. We're not going to get an apology from either side. Harry's not going to apologize to his father and William. William and the King are not going to apologize to Harry. It's not going to happen. I don't think. I'd be very surprised if it did. But like I said, the mature, like I said, there's the word mature coming up. The mature thing to do is draw a line in it. Just accept that what's happened has happened. Accept that both sides don't see eye to eye, and just move on. Just have a but. But it would entail an agreement of sorts, and that is that the royal family basically ban anybody that worked for them leaking stories planting stories planting information that i think would have to be a cornerstone of moving on and from ha from the royal family's point of view harry and meghan would have to agree not to do anything to make money <laughs> talking about other royal family members in other words no oprah no interviews no books, no, you know, anything that's talking about or revealing what, talking about other family members. And those two things are the cornerstones of drawing a line and moving on. And that's the only way forward that I see. Um, yeah, 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 I absolutely agree. You can forgive, but never forget. And But the thing is that I don't think necessarily that they are going to forgive and forget, but you can move on. You can have, you can almost draw a line and have a new day dot. You can have a new day dot and you can concentrate and build a relationship going forward. I think it's going to be the only way. Um, Lacey says, I want Prince Harry to attend the coronation. I want Meghan to stay in the USA where she is happiest. Well, <laughs> Leslie says, it'll be great if Harry and Meghan did no publicity, say if they're coming or not, just show up, smiling, looking beautiful. Give a show of support for Charles, who um, thought we would be crowning Camilla here. Who for, well, I mean, who, you know, 20 years ago, who did think we'd be crowning Camilla? But no, I think the first sign was when they got married in 2005, even though there was that thing saying that she was going to be known as Princess Consort. I didn't truly believe it, and I don't really think anyone else did either. So um, I, for me, it was all sealed on the day that they got married, to be honest. Um, okay, the next thing that I think we need to talk about, or rather the last thing, unless you have any burning questions, is the Gold State Coach. So information has been revealed that... Um, the Gold State coach will have a reduced role at the coronation. So in the in the late Queen's coronation, she um, arrived at the Abbey and um, and left the Abbey via the Gold State coach. Now the Gold State coach. Now I do think I know why. Oh, but let's just say what the change is. I've got so much I want to tell you. So um, what's going to happen is. Charles and Camilla will go to the Abbey in a different mode of transportation. It could be another carriage, of which there are numerous carriages. It could even be the Golden Jubilee carriage, the Australian carriage. There are so many different carriages. Um, or it could even be car. I don't think it will be car, but I'm thinking it, it will be some kind of carriage. There are different carriages that have closed tops, open tops. So there will be a bad weather con contingency there as well. But the Gold State coach will be used after Charles is crowned to go back to the palace, of, of course, using that ceremonial route. So the Gold State coach, if you, I, I wish I could put a picture on for you, but the Gold State coach is that highly decorated uh, one that's got panels with like, uh, like murals, like old, really old paintings. It's, it's gold. Um, lots of you know, flancy details, um, but it's very, very uncomfortable. The Queen herself commented, when asked about, you know, how was the ride to the coronation, she said it was very uncomfortable, and that's because it doesn't have very good suspension. 
<laughs> it was built in something like 17, in the 1700s. So it, it's not a modern coach. And a lot more of the modern ones have better suspension. Some of them have got air conditioning or heating in. So there are better, uh, more comfortable options to use. However, it's not as grand as the Gold State coach. Now, I think I know why. Putting those two pieces of information together, I think I know why Charles has said we'll only use the Gold State coach on the way back, uh, limiting its use. And I think it's all based on the comfort level. Um, you may have seen, you may know, but Charles always has a little cushion with him. He's got a bad back. I think he hurt it playing polo years ago. And wherever he goes, whether it's to a banquet or in a car or in a carriage, whatever it is, he always has his little cushion with him. Um, so he never travels without this cushion. It's always, uh, I think it's the lumbar region of his back, so always lower back. He, he gets a lot of lower back pain. And I think he's deemed the Gold State coach too, too bumpy and too painful to, to, to use twice. And certainly, you do not want to have an uncomfortable spine going to the coronation where you then have to sit for a very long time, although it is a reduced time. Um, you know, there's a lot of sitting involved. And if you've got a bad back, you want to be comfortable. And I think Charles has said, well, we'll use the state coach coming back, but I can't do it twice. Uh, so I think it's all to do with comfort. And I think it's to do with his bad back. Yes, the late queen said she hated that coat. Well, no, she didn't hate the coat. She hated the, the bumpiness of it. So I suppose you could say she hated the coat. But in terms of its uh, magnificence, it was a, it's a really amazing coat. I've seen it up close. I've got photos of it. Um, it really is gorgeous, but uncomfortable. Uh, Richard Ring says, I worked as a footman in the royal household staff. And the whole question of whether Charles would ever use the, uh, use the crown was questioned. European monarchs don't have coronations. Um, I think in the UK, we've always beaten our own drum. We haven't ever really ever moved necessarily in line with um, European monarchies. Mainland European monarchies um, tend to operate a little bit differently to what we do. We are very rooted in our traditions. Um, and I, in my mind, I mean, I'm, I can't vouch for what was going on behind the scenes. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you're not wrong. I'm sure, you know, um, I'm sure the talk was more about whether or not um, that kind of pomp and circumstance would ever be relevant whenever the, the time came. Um, and I think what must have been decided is that, yes, you know, pomp and circumstance is needed uh, and that a, a full coronation will take place, that the public are in support of the pomp and the circumstance and the coaches. Um, I am a little bit disappointed if Charles doesn't wear the breeches and the tights and the little flouncy bits. I do think um, that fits the whole look. Um, for me, Admiral of the Fleet is kind of siding with one uh, royal service above others. You know, let's, let's not forget that Charles is head of the other forces as well. So Admiral of the Fleet, to me, seems like you're kind of Picking a favourite, if you like. Um, so I, I want to see the full tights. I want to see, I want to see the britches. I want to see all that good stuff going on. Um, uh, Rich said the coach I walked alongside at the Golden Jubilee to St Paul's Cathedral at the Golden Jubilee, but I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't use the crown uh, at the state opening of Parliament. Oh well, don't forget there's two crowns. There's a St Edward's crown and the imperial state crown. So on the coronation day, um, Charles will wear both. So he will wear the imperial state crown, but the actual crown that will be lifted onto his head at the crowning moment is the St. Edward's crown. And that is a lot more gold. Uh, again, I wish I could put a picture on the screen for you, but it's a, it's a more golden crown. I think it's technically heavier because it's more gold. It's got more gold weight than the imperial state crown, but the imperial state crown is the one that's worn um, at the state opening of parliament. That's more glitzy, it's more glam, there's more diamonds and it's sparkly and 
Um, I would say that's the crown that most people would think about when they think about a crowning. But no, the actual crowning moment will be the St. Edward's crown, which is um, which is the way it's it's been. Um, Amber says, as a British subject, do you even consider yourself European? Your culture always seems very different from Europe. I think people in the UK have a very complicated relationship with Europe. Um, I mean, going back generations, there's been wars and skirmishes between different, you know, different allies and things. Um, I think modern day Britain, when it comes to Europe, I mean, obviously we, you know, we, we, we voted and we chose to leave um, the um, European um, Union. Not, you know, we haven't voted ourselves out of Europe. We are, we are geographically in Europe, but we're not in in the kind of union that that we were previously a member of. So I think people have a very complicated relationship. I mean, people, I think people in Britain see themselves primarily, most people, I'm not talking for everyone, but most people think of themselves as British rather than necessarily Europe. If you ask them what they were, I don't think the first word that would roll off their tongue would be, I'm European. I think they would say, I'm British, probably the same in France and Germany. People would probably say, well, I'm French above European. Um, but no, I think I think we are in, in the United Kingdom very, very different to mainland Europe. I mean, in certain ways, we have a lot in common with the USA, Canada, Australia. Um, you know, Europe can sometimes see seem a bit of a different place. Uh, but we are on the continent, we are geographically in Europe, we are positioned where we're positioned, and, you know, we will always be so. And I think a complicated relationship will always exist between the United Kingdom and Europe, but we will always figure it out. There'll always be, I mean, even this time, post-Brexit, you know, eventually everything will sort itself out, levels will be found, um, and I'm sure collaborations and working together to you know with common causes will become a thing so you know there you go chris russ says if camilla is queen camilla and kate is in the papers at times as princess kate then megan is princess megan paper talk in the press talk is very different for example diana was not actually princess diana oh i know shock horror no she was always the princess of wales um, she was a princess of the of the United Kingdom through a marriage. The same as Catherine. Catherine is not Princess Kate. Uh, she's a princess of the United Kingdom through marriage. Technically, she's Princess William. If you want to give her a princess title, she's Princess William uh, of Wales now. Uh, but no, she's not. Her title is the Princess of Wales. Meghan is not technically Princess Meghan. Uh, again, she is a princess of the United Kingdom, even now, after leaving the royal family, she's a princess of the United Kingdom, but technically she's Princess Henry. She is the Princess Henry. Uh, but of course, because they have a ducal title, you use the ducal title first. Um, of course, they are not permitted to use the HRH. It was an informal agreement, and so far... As far as I'm aware, they haven't used the HRH in terms of any commercial purposes. But no, technically, the press are wrong. Um, there is no Princess Diana. There is no Princess Kate. There is no Princess Meghan. Um, it's just, it's just what the press call them. But it's not, it's not anything real. It's, it's made up. Uh, why does he go by Harry if he's named Henry? The, his parents called him Harry. Is technically a Henry, but ever from since young, uh, his parents, Diana and Charles, called him Harry. So there you go. But um, Harry, you know, Harry is uh, kind of like a nickname to someone called Henry. We're weird in Britain. We, we are weird. For example, Henry VIII, um, he was known as the Good King Harry. Good King in inverted um, commas. But no, he was known also as, as Harry. So he was a Henry that was known as a Harry, kind of. So it goes back all those, all those years, so to speak. Uh, 
Uh, ooh, did King uh, George the Sixth wear the? Yes, he wore the breeches. <laughs> wear the breeches. Just wear. Just put the breeches on and wear them. My goodness. Uh, Carmen says he should honor tradition and use the stockings, the breeches, the whole lot, showing the respect. I agree, <laughs> but it's his choice. I mean, it's his coronation. He can change things, as we've discussed in this chat. So many things are going to be different, uh, and that is the reigning monarch of the day's prerogative. If William wanted to go back to a three-hour service when he's king, wanted to wear the stockings and breeches, there's no necessarily precedent set by Charles changing things. If William wanted to go back to wearing breeches and having a three-hour ceremony and all the rest of it, having you know 6,000 people in the abbey, he could do. Um, Amal says, did you do history? No, I didn't do history at university. Uh, I wish I had, to be honest, because I think I would have really enjoyed it. But no, this is just knowledge that I've acquired over the years myself. Sometimes I don't actually think you need a university <laughs> to know a subject. If you are really, truly interested in a subject, you will find your own materials. You'll find your own reading list. I have read so many proper, big, thick, probably books that most people would consider very boring, you know, accounts of different monarchs and all the way up. And, you know, I, I've always been interested in, in, in the royal programming and the documentaries and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I guess I've given myself the knowledge because it's something that I'm interested in. And I think I would implore anyone, if you have an interest in something, you know, go, go really deep into it. Don't hold back. Just, you know, find proper you know history books if it's history or if it's gardening you're into then you know watch gardening videos um you know read gardening books try and acquire the knowledge and that's what i've done over over many 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 years of course from young um but yeah um do you think parliament should vote to remove harry and Meghan's title well you are right in saying that it would take a vote uh in Parliament, there would have to be something put forward to amend certain acts. So certain acts are in place, the uh, Titles Acts, and the latest kind of, well, the last update to remove titles was actually after, um, was it during or, it was either during or after the Second World War, and any supporters of uh, Germany or anything that was deemed to be traitors um they were stripped of their titles their british titles during the act so um so an act would have to be, have to be made um i mean the king could propose to parliament that that happens he could do that informally during one of his uh, private meetings his private audiences weekly audiences with the prime minister who could then potentially put a motion forward or you could talk to a politician and potentially get a motion put forward um but it would have to be voted on so it's not impossible it's not it's not a you know no they could never ever ever remove harry and Meghan's titles charles himself couldn't do it um he can amend like personal titles and things in very much the same way for example i think that um that prince, prince and princess titles have been removed in mainland Europe. I think the Norwegian uh, royal family ha has done it. I think that can be done. But in terms of the ducal titles, that cannot be done. And, and in terms of the line of succession as well, that would have to be an act of parliament. So uh, I, don't, I don't foresee that happening. Um, I don't foresee, unless Harry and Meghan do something that's really, really deplorable, uh, that cannot be tolerated. But I think most things do have a tolerance level. Um, and I don't think we're quite, although Harry and Meghan have done quite a lot, I don't think we're quite at that level yet where that would be considered. Um, but it's not impossible. Stranger things have happened at sea. um chris says then camilla is queen consort no <laughs> no you are a consort queen because you are married to a king a, a reigning sovereign um you are not queen in your own right so camilla is 
is not a sovereign queen, but she, she will be known as Queen Camilla. She is a queen consort, but the queen consort is not a title that any queen has used. It's not an official title. Uh, Little Annie says, the king's wife is usually known as queen. Yes. <laughs> Netta says, I don't see King Charles doing that. He still loves Harry. Yeah, even though Harry is being a major brat at the moment, parents love uh, for their child goes deep. I just think they need to draw a line and move on. Build a bridge and get over it. Both sides, to be quite honest. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but it's, it's starting to grate on me, my loves. I don't know how much more I can take of it, seriously. Anyway, but I'm sure it will rumble on for a much longer time. Right, I'm going to go now. Um, so if you have enjoyed this live chat and this catch up, then please give this video a big old thumbs up. It really does help if you interact with the video to get it pushed out to more and more people that might be interested in this sort of content. So leave a comment, um, hit the like button, and don't forget to share this video on Facebook, on Twitter, on all the different social medias, again, so that more people can, can get to see it and, you know, hear things as they actually are, rather than other people's twisted opinions uh, put together as fact, which is often out there right now. Anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, I really do appreciate it. You taking your time to spend your Sunday, or whenever you're watching me, uh, spending time listening. So thank you, and I hope you have an amazing week. I am going somewhere royal next week. So if you don't hear from me for a few days, just know that I am away, and I, I will be somewhere royal. So there will be some vlogs coming up from the place I'm going to on my other channel, which I will leave linked in the description box below. Uh, so until then, to you all. Oh, can you guess where I'm going, by the way? Mwah to you all and goodbye.